Okay, so um, just letting everybody into the webinar. I'm just going to give a few moments for everybody to join. You can see people are just filtering in to the webinar. Uh, we've got quite a few people booked on, so it'll just take a few minutes for everybody to, to join. Just make sure everybody's audio is working. Welcome, everybody. Just giving you a few moments to join the session before we begin. Okay, just giving people a few more moments to drift into the session. Uh, make sure your audio is working okay, and then we'll make a start in a moment. Okay, uh, we're going to begin the session. So welcome everybody to this uh, Fall Into Nature webinar. Uh, this session is on saving our rainforests, an introduction to UK temperate rainforest and its management. Uh, we're now into the third week of the Fall Into Nature series. And um, if you have missed some sessions uh, during that time that you'd like to catch up on, you can watch those on our YouTube channel and we'll be posting a link to our YouTube channel in the chat um, um, at times throughout the session so you can look at that. Um, and we've also got a week yeah. left. Um, it runs up until the end of the month, the Fall Into Nature series. So do check out the rest of the sessions to see if there are other things you'd like to come along to. Um, so this session today is being run by myself. I'm Alison Smith. Uh, and I work for Plant Life on building resilience in Southwest Woodlands, which is our temperate rainforest project in the Southwest of England. And um, I'm joined by my colleague, Kate Hines, um, who also works on the project and she's going to be helping run the session today. Um, and in the background, we've also got another colleague, Rachel Jones, um, who uh, is the project manager and she's just going to be managing uh, the chat and the Q&A for us. Uh, in this session. Um, so during today's session, if you have any questions, uh, please do put them into the Q&A. Uh, you should see a little tab on the bottom of your screen saying Q&A, so you can type your questions in there. Uh, and we'll have time at the end where we're going to answer those. Uh, and we may um, answer some of them in the chat during the session as well. So please use the Q&A for your questions rather than the chat. Uh, that would be wonderful. Um, so without any further ado, we're going to make a start. Uh, so today's session, uh, we're going to be looking at what is temperate rainforest. So this is a habitat that is a priority for plant life. It's an extremely special habitat, particularly for rare lichens and bryophytes, mosses and liverworts. So we're going to be talking about what's so special about that habitat and why we want to work uh, in that habitat protect it. Um, I'm then going to talk to you a little bit more about some of the key lichen communities and bryophyte communities that we find in our temperate rainforests, some of the special species and communities to look out for, the sorts of habitats that they need and the sorts of conditions they need to thrive in. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you about some of the management issues, because although this is an extremely important and internationally important habitat that we have in the UK, which is really rich in lichens and bryophytes, it's also under threat uh, from many different issues. Um, some of those are site-based issues to do with um, how woodlands are managed and changes in woodland management in recent decades. And some of those are sort of bigger external issues, such as climate change, a tree disease, particularly ash dieback. So we're going to look at some of the issues that are threatening our temperate rainforests. And then I'm going to hand over to my colleague Kate, who's going to talk you through our rapid woodland assessment, which is a tool that we've devised in the southwest, uh, which we're looking to roll out to other parts of the UK, which helps uh, lands managers and volunteers and all different people, actually, to go into an area of woodland and assess whether it's temperate rainforest and whether it has the potential to support rare lichens and bryophytes to identify potential management issues and um, so that we can start to get a better understanding um, of our temperate rainforest across the UK um, and start to engage more people in thinking about how we can manage it better. 
Um, and we'll talk you through some of the results we've had from that in the southwest of England and how that's informing our work. Uh, and then we're going to finish up with a Q&A. So there'll be plenty of opportunity um, to ask questions uh, at the end as well. OK, so. Um, so temperate rainforest then is this in incredibly diverse habitat for lichens and bryophytes. So this image here um, is a sort of iconic image. This is a uh, Wisman's Wood up on Dartmoor, which is a high altitude oak wood with uh, oak trees that are stunted. They're hundreds of years old, but they're stunted due to the, um, the high altitude that they're growing at. Um, but as with our te all temperate rainforests, the conditions are very, very humid, moist, uh, and mild as well, so not a great deal of temperature variation throughout the year. Uh, and the air is very clean, and this creates the perfect conditions for this really lush growth uh, of lichens and bryophytes. So bryophytes are the mosses and liverworts. So you can see the boulders are carpeted in bryophytes. There are lichens growing on some of those boulders too. Uh, and the trees, the branches, the trunks are uh, festooned with, uh, with lichens and bryophytes. Um, and this is sort of typical of a really uh, good quality temperate rainforest, what you might expect to see. And our temperate rainforests in the UK um, are actually some of the most diverse areas for lichens and bryophytes. So in terms of the bryophyte flora, they rival the cloud forests of the Andes in the tropics uh, for their species diversity. Um, we have um, over a uh, half of all of Europe's bryophyte flora found in the UK, which is an exceptional proportion for such a small island. Um, and many of those species are found within our temperate rainforests. On the lichens front, we have 10% of the global diversity in the UK. So again, a sort of staggering proportion for such a small place. Um, and 75% of the lichens that we have an international responsibility to conserve are found in our temperate rainforest. So this is a really important habitat, which is why plant life um, sees this as one of our priority habitats to work in. And temperate rainforests, as I say, need these wet conditions all year round. And so even when the rainfall isn't as high at certain times of year, the, the conditions are still very, very humid. Um, so I'm based down in uh, south of Cornwall, where we have temperate rainforest. Um, and today um, we're experiencing weather that we have a lot, which is um, mizzle. I don't know if this is a term that people have in other parts of the UK, but mizzle uh, is our word for a cross between mist and drizzle. Um, and it's the sort of weather that we have uh, you know, all throughout the year, really, um, which which isn't always um, perfect for going to the beach, but it's fantastic for lichens and bryophytes. So these wet, humid conditions all year round and low variation in temperature. So we don't have a lot of frost. We don't have um, long periods of the year where the moisture is locked up in snow and ice. And um, so that will help create these wet conditions for the lichens and the bryophytes. Um, and ecological continuity is really important as well. So I'm just going to show you a map here and um, you can see where we find temperate rainforest within the UK. So it's down the western coast of Scotland and um, down into northern England in the Lake District um, in western Wales, uh, north and mid Wales and down into the southwest of England uh, in the northwestern Northern Ireland as well. Um, and these are the areas where we have the influence of the Gulf Stream and we have the southwesterly prevailing winds. So it's bringing that warm, wet air to that western coast of the UK uh, and also clean air as well. So the, the conditions of the air quality are generally cleaner because of that southwest prevailing wind. Um, but within these areas where you can see the green, obviously not all of the woodland is temperate rainforest. We have many areas where there are conifer plantations, more recent broadleaf plantations, and there are variations in the climate. So a lot of this area is classed as upland Britain, um, but there are more lowland areas. So down here in the southwest, um, on some of the southeastern parts of Devon, for example, where the, the areas are more low lying, um, the conditions are a little bit drier and we don't find the temperate rainforest there. So you need really those uh, very specific climatic conditions, as well as that ecological continuity woodland that has existed for a long period of time and where the conditions have been relatively stable 
for temperate rainforests to thrive and for the lichens and bryophytes that live there to thrive as well. Um, temperate rainforest is a globally rare habitat, which is one of the reasons why it's so important. So you can see here um, on the right, uh, a world map showing the global distribution. So the dark green areas are showing where we find the temperate rainforest. So you see it's really restricted um, to a few areas in the world, um, generally on the coasts um, and in areas where there's um, quite a lot of upland topography as well. Uh, and on the left hand side, you can see in Europe, most of this temperate rainforest is on that west, western coast of Europe through Norway, down through the UK, uh, a little bit in Brittany and then um, northern Spain and northern Portugal. Um, and actually within this area, um, many of the temperate rainforests are under threat from lots of different issues. Um, and certainly the legacy of air pollution, the recent, uh, the last century, um, many species just cling on in a few areas. And there are quite a number of species that only now remain in the UK, which is one of the reasons why this is such an important habitat uh, for us to conserve. And we have an international responsibility to conserve many of the rare lichens and bryophytes that we find there. So just um, in summary, the, the highest quality temperate rainforest sites for lichens and bryophytes are those where we have um, a diversity of uh, compositions. So we have lots of different tree species growing there. And um, we often think of temperate rainforest, people talk about Atlantic oak woods, and there's a real emphasis on oak. And oak is an important species, but there are other trees there as well. And um, so we have quite a lot of oak plantations uh, down in the southwest of England, where oak was planted up in upland areas for the tanning industry. Um, and those plantations are much less diverse in terms of their lichens and bryophytes uh, than the more natural woodlands, where you have a range of different tree species providing different surfaces for different lichens and bryophytes to grow on. Um, good quality rainforest sites also have a diverse structure with a range of young and old trees, open spaces and shadier areas, again providing a range of microclimates and niches. And diverse topography, so we've talked about these sites being in upland Britain where we often have um, very high rainfall, the topography is generally very diverse, so we have lots of deeply incised ravines, waterfalls, um, and that just creates a whole range of different surfaces and microclimates for things to grow on. Oops, sorry, slides are moving on without my control. Um, so we've got a whole range of niches and, and different surfaces and microclimates for lichens and bryophytes. And I'm just going to take you through now. Um, we're going to move on to look at some of the temperate rainforest lichens. Um, so some of the some, some of the lichen species and some of the lichen communities that our temperate rainforests are important for. Uh, and there's going to be a bit of a focus in this uh, session on the southwest temperate rainforest, because that's where Kate and myself work. Um, but a plant like we're working across the UK. Um, so we have a big project in Scotland called uh, the Saving Scotland's Rainforest Alliance, which is led by Plant Life and the Woodland Trust. Um, and we're doing a lot of work in Wales as well, um, in the Merionet area. Um, and we have previously worked in the Lake District, and then we've got our big project in the southwest of England on temperate rainforest. Um, so the, the lichen communities that I'm going to talk to you about now um, are particularly found in the southwest of England, um, but we also find uh, some of them in, in Scotland and Wales as well. So lichens, um, some of you may have been on our session last week where we did an introduction to lichens, bryophytes and ferns. And we talked a little bit uh, more in detail about what lichens are. But for those of you who weren't at that session and don't know, I just wanted to give a little snapshot um, so that I'm not just talking about lichens without you really having an understanding of what, what they are. Um, so lichens are composite organisms. They're not uh, single organisms. They're actually a symbiosis between a fungus uh, and a photosynthetic partner, which is usually an alga, uh, or in some cases a cyanobacterium. Um, and it's a symbiotic relationship because the fungus uh, cannot produce its own food. 
Uh, it relies on the photosynthetic partner for that. And the photosynthetic partner benefits from the relationship by being uh, provided with a stable environment, the fungal partner, which provides the, the surface layer, the cortex, um, and the sort of structure actually helps to protect the, the alga or the cyanobacterium from drying out and helps to protect it from UV radiation. Um, the lichens need plenty of light for that photosynthesis to happen, particularly because you have a fungal cortex over the, the photosynthetic partner. So they're actually just beneath the surface layer, they need lots and lots of light in order to photosynthesize. So that's really important in terms of temperate rainforest and woodland lichens, um, because you obviously have a canopy providing some level of shade. It's really important that there are areas where the sunlight can get down so that those lichens can grow. Uh, they need plenty of moisture, so that's why temperate rainforests are such diverse environments for lichens. Uh, many of our lichens as well, um, they, they don't have, no lichens have roots, they all absorb their water and nutrients through the surface, and that makes them very, very sensitive and vulnerable to changes, particularly in things like air pollution, um, it makes them sensitive to the substrate that they're growing on, um, so water runs across at the surface and then onto the lichen and they absorb that water. So if that water um, has been exposed to any pollutants or it's running over acidic rock, that water, will, the pH will change slightly and that will affect the lichen that grows there. Or if it's running over alkaline rock or bark, the pH of the water will change and that will affect the lichens that grow. So they're very, very sensitive and they have very specific ecological requirements. Uh, and, and some of them are slow colonizers, not all of them. Some lichens are very fast to colonize uh, and common species um, can colonize new woodland and isolated woodland even fairly quickly because there are lots and lots of fungal spores in the air uh, and they're able to colonize. Um, our rarer temperate rainforest lichens are generally slow to colonize because if they're lost from a landscape and you have fragmented woodland, they're not going to be able to get back into that woodland um, once, once they've been lost. Um, so it's really important that we're looking after um, these, uh, these rare lichens where we find them because once they've gone, uh, it's really difficult to get them back. So we're just going to talk to you about lichen communities. We talk a lot um, uh, within temperate rainforests about lichen communities. Um, and what we're actually talking about are just, just lichens that like to grow in similar environments. So they're not necessarily taxonomically linked. Um, the, the species might not all be from the same genus. They could be you know, unrelated, but they're lichens that like to grow in the same conditions. So we, we describe those as lichen communities. And the factors that influence the lichen communities that you find somewhere are the chemistry of the substrate they're growing on. So in the case of temperate rainforests, the tree bark or the rock that they're growing on. Um, and there's a table here, which is taken from our um, management guide for temperate rainforests, um, which just shows you the, the pHs of different tree species, the bark on different tree species. So you'll get certain communities of lichen that like to grow on the acidic bark trees, um, such as alder, birch, young oak. Um, and then you get other lichens that prefer to grow on more base rich bark, such as ash trees, hazel, willow, even sycamore, and old oak. So oak's an interesting one because the pH of the bark changes as the tree ages and the tannin quantities increase. Um, so actually the types of lichens that you find on oak can change as the tree gets older. Um, and that's, this is just an interesting table as well. If you're thinking about lichen conservation, some of the communities that grow on base rich bark um, previously grew a lot on elm, which we've now lost a lot of from our countryside, um, grow very well on ash and we've now got ash dieback. So thinking about conserving some of these lichen communities that like to grow on the base rich bark is a, is a key issue. Um, other factors that influence a lichen community are the climate. So we have certain lichen communities that like to grow in the temperate rainforest, but then within the temperate rainforest, we have a whole range of microclimates uh, within a woodland, um, particularly with different topography, you'll have more sheltered areas, you'll have more humid areas down in the river valleys. Um, so you'll see different lichen communities and even on a single tree, you'll find different communities as well. So this photograph here, is of a veteran uh, tree on Exmoor, I think this was an oak, um, and 
you can see um, this white uh, lichen growing up the side of the trunk. And this is a crust lichen. Um, and it's one of the species that grows on very old oak trees. It's one of the ancient dry bark species. So it's growing on this sheltered dry side of the tree trunk. And we then have um, this very mossy area on the trunk where you've got water running down. Um, so that part of the tree trunk has a very different microclimate and that you can actually find Liberian community lichens growing there, which are lichens that like to grow in much wetter conditions. So on one tree, you've already got two lichen communities and actually out on the, the twigs and the branches of this tree, which are more well lit, more exposed, um, you have another community growing there. So on a single tree, you can have multiple microclimates, you can even have different chemistry in different parts of the tree and you'll get different lichen communities growing there. And the topography of a substrate can also influence the lichens you find. Um, so there may be areas of smoother bark and rougher bark and different species will grow there. These are some of the um, key lichen communities that we find in temperate rainforest. Um, and I'm just going to talk to you um, about these four communities. Um, these are four communities that we find across the UK's temperate rainforest. There are others as well, uh, but I'm just going to talk to you about these four and give you an idea of where you find them and the sorts of lichens that you might find growing there. So if you um, own woodland or manage woodland, this will give you an indication of what to look for. Um, if you're in a temperate rainforest area, what to look for um, to see if you might have something interesting. So I'm going to start off with the ancient dry bark community. Um, and I really, I really like this community of lichens. It's not the most charismatic. Um, the species are all quite small, crusto species of lichens. So they, they look like they've been painted onto the bark. They're not really big, luxurious, leafy or bushy lichens. Um, but, they, but they are still really interesting, particularly when you get up close and look at them with a the hand lens. Um, so what you're looking for is very, very old trees. Um, often we're looking at oak trees that are around 300 years old plus um, on the craggy bark, on the dry and sheltered sides of those trees. This is where you find the ancient dry bark lichen community. And you're looking for mosaics of gray, white and gray brown crust on those trees. And often you can sort of spot it at a distance. You can sort of see your old ancient trees with this, almost look like they've been uh, splattered with uh, white paint. Um, so it's one that you can look out for and you're finding it in these dry areas. So they still need high humidity generally in the, in the wider climate, but they're growing on the much drier sheltered sides of the trees where you don't have direct runoff of water coming down. And um, the reason this community is one of the sort of standout ones for temperate rainforests is we actually have the best examples of this lichen community in the world, in the UK, um, in southwest England. And it's found um, on the North Exmoor coast, a place called Doctors Wood, um, has the best ancient dry bark lichen communities in the world um, on ancient, uh, ancient pollards, or I say pollards, but they're generally referred to um, by the woodland managers, uh, this is a site owned by the National Trust, as coppards, because they're sort of a cross between coppice and pollard. The height is sort of in midway between the two. Uh, and it's thought that this, that's because there were sheep grazing here, so they needed to, to pollard, but not at as high a level uh, as you might normally um, do. So you can see these ancient coppards here with their dry, craggy bark, and you can sort of see some of the gray patches on there, which are the ancient dry bark lichens. And this is one of the flagship species of this ancient dry bark community, Cresponia premnea. Um, and it is a, a crustose lichen and it has a sort of um, olive brown uh, background to it, which is the body of the lichen, the, the, the lichen phallus. But the, the black fruiting bodies are the things that stand out, which you can see clearly on this image here. And those are the fungal fruiting bodies. And they look a little bit like uh, little black tires um, sort of dotting the bark. So that's one of the things to, to look out for. Um, so if you've got ancient dry bark, um, you've got 
uh, trees often on slopes so you don't tend to find this down in the river valleys where it's very humid but you often find it more on exposed slopes so there's a lot of air circulation uh, the air's a little bit drier and then it's worth looking out for this community of lichens. The next one I'm going to talk to you about is the Liberian community. Um, so this is one that we again talk about a lot uh, at Plant Life. We're doing a lot of work to try and help conserve this community um, in the southwest of England at the moment. Um, in Scotland, this community is thriving. Um, but in the rest of the UK, it's really um, dramatically declined, um, particularly during the last century with acid rain and air pollution. Um, and it's just sort of clinging on um, in a few um, really good temperate rainforest sites. Uh, but it likes to go on base rich bark and rock and it needs well lit conditions, but very, very humid conditions as well. And so many lichens, you tend to look on the opposite side of the tree to where you find a lot of the bryophytes, but the Liberian community you often find growing amongst the bryophytes, growing amongst the mosses, which help to retain moisture and regulate the microclimate for it. Um, but because these species grow on um, base rich bark, a lot of it grows on ash. Um, so with ash dieback really, really under threat, um, we have places where we're working here in southwest England, um, where the woodland managers are saying they need to fell hundreds of ash trees uh, for safety reasons. And there are many of them have Liberian lichens on them um, or could have, but, but they have the trees haven't been surveyed. So we're kind of in this um, crisis situation where we need to try and mitigate those impacts um, on this really important lichen community. Um, a high proportion of the species that are in the Liberian lichen community in our temperate rainforests, we have an international responsibility to conserve them. And um, so one of the key things we're looking at doing is thinking about what are the other tree species that, that these lichens can grow on in particular woodlands. Often it's old oak or it might be hazel. Um, so it's really important to ensure that the conditions around those trees are optimum and can support the Liberian lichens. And often that's about creating a little bit more light around those trees. Uh, and sort of worst case scenario where there, where there aren't any other options, it's, it's actually about translocating some of the lichens off those dying ash trees onto the other, onto the other species. And these are a few of the Liberian community lichens. So this time we're looking at often large leafy species. Um, we have a, a, some wonderful guides um, that we can link to in the chat um, where you can, you can look at the Liberian lichens for Southwest England. And we have similar ones for Scotland and Wales. Um, but you're looking at these lovely leafy lichens. Many of them have a cyanobacterium partner uh, as well as an algal partner. So we, we often find these brown, greys, um, really showy leafy lichens. Um, and on the previous image there, um, we have the Liberia pulmonaria, which is tree lungwort, which is sort of the flagship species for this lichen community. Okay, uh, the next one I was going to talk to you about is the Parmelian community. And this is a community of lichens um, that grows on, this time on the acid bark uh, and rock. Um, this is another very showy uh, community with lots of bushy and leafy species. Um, and again, needs very high levels of humidity and, and quite high levels of light as well. Um, so sort of similar to the Liberian communities, but growing on the acid bark and rock. So often on a younger oak, on birch, on alder, on hawthorn. Um, and what we're looking for um, is these grey, green, leafy and bushy lichens and white and grey splats. So the image on the left um, is a really good example of this. Um, so if you've got tree trunks in particular that, that look like this, that are sort of covered in these lichens, that's a really good sign of a healthy temperate rainforest. You only get this where you've got light actually coming down and reaching the trunks of trees. Uh, and one of the big threats um, to temperate rainforests, and actually it's an issue across woodland across the UK, is a lack of light reaching down uh, towards the tree trunks and the forest floor. Um, so in the last 
uh, sort of 60 odd years, our woodlands have changed dramatically and they've become much, much more uniformly shady and closed canopy. Um, so around about the 1950s, 1960s, a study was done on UK woodland that showed around 50% of all woodland in the UK was managed as high forest and considered as high forest with um, tall trees and a closed canopy. Around 28% was scrub or pasture woodland uh, and another 20 odd percent was coppice woodland. Um, so this was quite a, a mixture of, of woodland type and structure. Um, this was repeated around the turn of the century and found that 97% of UK woodland was now managed and classed as high forest. So that's a dramatic shift in a relatively short space of time to, to much more uniformly dense closed canopy woodlands. And that's, that's also been very much the case in temperate rainforest, uh, a habitat that traditionally would, would be much more open, lots of pasture woodlands. So that's had a dramatic impact on these lichens. The next community I was going to um, briefly mention to you is the smooth bark community of lichens. Uh, and this is a very different community that grows on smooth bark trees, particularly on hazel. Um, and we're looking at crust species again, instead of the big bushy leafy lichens. This community is characterized by white, gray and brown crusts with dots and squiggles. And so you don't always need to have um, in-depth and technical lichen identification skills to recognize some of these communities. And um, sometimes it's actually about looking at their form, looking at the shapes uh, and, and looking in the right habitats to see if you think you might have those sorts of communities. Um, and obviously later down the line, if you do have interesting things, it'd be, be trying to get a species survey done as well uh, to find out exactly what you have. Um, this image on the left um, sort of shows you um, a, a, a typical uh, rich community uh, of the smooth bark lichens where you have just a mosaic. So um, some of the woodlands near where I live, um, which are ancient woodland, which has some really old um, areas of hazel um, with plenty of light, you, you get branches and stems of the hazel, which are like this, where you can't really find any bare bark. It's just a sort of mosaic of lichens tessellating one another. Um, and you see these um, lovely script lichens with these squiggly fruiting bodies, and then others which have these sort of pinprick-like fruiting bodies. Um, so it's really um, magnificent to look at. And uh, the best examples are in more well-lit areas again. So when it's very shady, um, you tend to find certain species will dominate. So uh, the species in the bottom of this image um, is sometimes known as a pox lichen, with all these tiny little black dots. Uh, it's a pyrenula species. That, that tends to dominate where it's quite shaded, but where you've got better lit conditions, you will find more of the script lichens. And this one here, Gracchus scripta, is um, one of the, again, sort of flagship species of that community, which you'll find amongst other rarer species in well-lit old um, areas with ecological continuity. Okay, so those are some of the different lichen communities. So you can see they've got different ecological requirements, uh, slightly different climatic conditions that they need, as well as different substrates, uh, but all of them generally needing quite a lot of light and, and all of them needing that ecological continuity. So I'm just going to move on to talk a little bit about the bryophytes now. Um, so we don't have the same sort of communities um, with the bryophytes, um, but there are a number of key habitats within temperate rainforests um, that if you're a woodland manager, you, you would be looking at if you're trying to see if you've got interesting bryophyte flora and thinking about where you perhaps want to focus your management efforts in terms of enhancing bryophyte flora. We're going to talk about some of those key habitats and also some of the indicator species that you might look out for. Um, so um, in temperate rainforests in the UK, if you have rocky ravines in an area where the climate is suitable, um, that's going to suggest um, high bryophyte interest. Um, so the, just the, the, the rocky ravines with fast flowing water, the splash of the water creates these really good humid conditions and a variety of rocky substrates. So that's a, a really good place to look for interesting bryophytes in a temperate rainforest. Um, 
boulders and rock faces. Uh, so again, it's, it's about this topography that we have in temperate rainforests that can make it so rich for these species. Um, where with the lichens, we're often looking at south facing areas being richest. With bryophytes, often we're looking at the opposite and it's the sort of northwest aspect um, that, that tends to be best when we're looking at things like boulders and rock faces. Um, and we would hope to see a woodland floor which is carpeted with bryophytes and not dominated by vascular plants as well. Um, so usually to have that you need some level of grazing in order to suppress the vascular plant growth and provide the space for the bryophytes to grow. And this is another uh, sort of threat to our temperate rainforests as often that grazing has been lost. Um, and those riparian areas are really key for bryophytes, and particularly when we think about climate change. And uh, the bryophytes are very, very vulnerable. Some of our rarer oceanic liverworts, uh, in particular, uh, very vulnerable to desiccation if we start to have longer dry spells. And um, so, having a bit more canopy cover over those riparian areas, which are rich for bryophytes, is very important. So things to look out for uh, and sort of indicator species. Um, a, a really good sign in the temperate rainforest is having a woodland floor that has large mats of these two species here. Um, we've got Dicranum magus, this is the greater fork moss, which is this lovely uh, bushy species. It's quite upright, uh, single stems usually, which arch over and the leaves curve really, really strongly. The leaves are described as being scimitar shaped, like a curved sword, these really long tapering tips. Uh, and then the other one on the right here, Rytidia delphus laureus, which is uh, known as the little shaggy moss, which is this sort of wiry, sprawling um, branched moss with a red stem. Uh, so these two species, they're not rare species, um, but um, you tend to find it perhaps in a temperate rainforest where the conditions aren't so good, you might just find small clumps of them. Um, if you see large areas carpeted with these species, and that's a really good sign um, that there's a good level of grazing, the vascular plants are suppressed, and that you're, you're more likely to find some of the rarer bryophytes as well. Deadwood is a really important habitat for the bryophytes, um, particularly where it's in a humid location, again, with a bit of canopy cover, helping um, maintain that humidity. Um, and something to look out for, which you don't need to have expert identification, um, identification skills to, to find, is this species here, uh, Cephalosia curvifolia. It's uh, known as rustwort, um, and it has this lovely rusty, reddy orange color to it. Um, and often that will cover large areas of, of dead wood and you'll just see a, a, a log, a fallen uh, a tree, which is this red brown colour, which really draws your, your eye in, even you know, walking along at a bit of a distance. Um, have a closer look and see if it's actually a liverwort creating that colour. Um, but it sort of looks like these long caterpillars, you sort of have these uh, threads, uh, which are this uh, rusty brown colour, and then they tend to have a sort of greenish tip to them. Uh, so that's a good one to look out for. Um, and if you find that, there's a, a good chance of having some other rare oceanic liverworts alongside it. Okay, and then rocks and trees, um, boulders, tree bases with um, other species like Bazania trilobata. Uh, this is a lovely oceanic liverwort, um, which is a, an important one from a conservation perspective. But also, if you find this, again, you're likely to find other rare things growing amongst it. And it's quite a distinctive one um, because it sort of, the, the stems come out and they fork at the tips, as you can see in the right hand image there. And each of the little leaves has three lobes on the tip, hence the name trilobata. So that's a, a good indicator species to look out for. And you'd expect to see it in very humid locations on boulders and tree bases. Uh, and then another good thing to look out for um, is filmy ferns. Again, growing in a similar sort of habitat on very humid boulders and tree trunks. The filmy ferns, again, a bit more distinctive um, to an untrained eye than some of the liverworts. It is a fern, it's not a bryophyte, um, but its presence, um, again, often signals that the conditions are, are really good and you're likely to find rare oceanic uh, bryophytes there as well. It's this very delicate, translucent fern 
um, you can actually see the, um, the veins um, through the leaves. The leaves are only one cell thick, which is why they're translucent and they look, it sort of looks more like a liverwort or a moss than a fern. Um, and these uh, fronds are between sort of two and 12 centimetres long. They're still a bit bigger than many of the bryophytes, so a little bit easier to, to spot. Um, so that's a good one to look out for if you're trying to find areas that could be rich in bryophytes um, in a temperate rainforest. Um, so the bryophytes then have different requirements to the lichens often, um, but, but shading, overshading can still be a real issue for them. Um, because where you've got very, very deep shade, you tend to get a few fast growing competitive species that will dominate. Um, so you still don't want too, too thick canopy cover or shrub layer um, and having a really dense layer of, of shrubs, of, of vascular plants, again, will outcompete the bryophytes. And um, so it's still important to have um, a, a little bit of light coming through, um, even for the bryophytes, but, but more canopy cover along those riparian areas. OK, so I'm I've kind of highlighted already some of the management issues, but I just want to talk um, about a few of them in a little bit more depth with you. Um, so lack of tree species diversity, I mentioned when you have these sorts of monocultures, for example, of oak, where you perhaps have a sessile oak plantation, um, that tends to be, um, you know, you tend to find less diversity there because you have fewer substrates, um, fewer different pHs of bark, um, bark roughness, so you're not going to get the same diversity. Uh, and the lack of tree age diversity as well is, is an issue in, in lots of um, our temperate rainforest sites, particularly those that have got a history um, of being managed as plantations. Um, so that uh, lack of tree age diversity again is going to mean fewer different substrates, uh, but also um, you have a, generally have a loss of woodland structure, so you tend to get quite a uniform uh, structure to the woodland. Um, and quite a uniform level of canopy closure. Uh, you won't have your veteran trees, there'll be fewer veteran trees um, and, and a lack of dead wood as well. So again, fewer different substrates uh, for things to grow on and a loss of open space. So those are key issues that I've sort of already touched on. Um, we also have um, invasive non-native species, which um, I think is quite well known about. Um, things like rhododendron and laurel, we know that they're an issue in our woodland um, and they are, they are underway and have been underway. Big project to try and remove those invasives from our temperate rainforests because they're obviously blocking out light and taking up space where our lichens and bryophytes would grow. Um, what is sometimes uh, talked about less is the invasive native or near native species that can also be a real issue due to changes in woodland management. Um, so we want to talk about that just a little bit more because um, this is something that we found to be a real issue um, and it's quite prevalent in the Southwest and that's dense holly growth. Um, so holly of course is a native species and it has a very important role to play within our temperate rainforest. Um, but it can um, form these really dense thickets um, in the understory, that actually um, a real threat to the lichens and bryophytes. So two images here, the one on the left um, is at Horner Wood uh, on Exmoor, where we've been working with the National Trust um, to halo thin around some of these veteran oaks. This is a slope, um, where um, we have some ancient dry bark community lichens down on the floodplain. There's lots of Liberian lichens where it's very humid. Coming up onto these slopes, there's a lot more airflow and it's a lot drier. Um, and you start to get these ancient dry bark species on some of the old oak trees. Um, but the problem has been that the holly, um, due to a, a loss of grazing, um, the holly has become really extensive in this area. Um, crowding around some of the bases of these trees. And so we've been working with the National Trust to halo thin and let more light in for those lichens. And then on the right hand image, this is in the Bobby Valley on Dartmoor, on the East Dartmoor National Nature Reserve. Um, there are lots of um, old wood banks running through the woodland, again with veteran trees, with a lot of lichen interest. Um, there are areas like this where the holly has really taken over. So again, it's about halo thinning uh, and letting more light in. 
Um, but of course, being aware that holly is an important species and it's an important species for lichens, in fact. So this is a, a, a lichen here, a pinhead lichen that grows um, specifically on old holly. Um, so management is about getting a mix, really, um, and having some trees that we leave, particularly the older hollies, that would be left um, as, um, as maiden trees, and then the younger holly being coppiced um, at, the, at the ground level to let the light in. Um, dense sycamore and beech regeneration has also been quite a big issue in a lot of the woodlands. Again, a loss of grazing and a loss of um, management in some of the woodlands, meaning that these trees are becoming really, really dense. Um, and again, that's blocking light um, on some of the tree trunks for the lichens and also um, blocking uh, light and space on the ground for the bryophytes. Ivy is another one which is sometimes perceived as being controversial, although I don't think it actually is. Um, so ivy, again, a really important native species for lots and lots of wildlife, um, but it can be an issue for lichens in particular where it's growing on trees that are important for those lichens. Um, so um, there are a few photographs here. So that the left hand image is showing um, a veteran pollard. Uh, this is at Waters Meet on Exmoor, another site where we've been working with the National Trust. Um, and there's a little bit of ivy just starting to grow up this tree. Uh, and this tree is supporting ancient dry bark community lichens. And um, so that here we would just be looking to um, prevent that ivy from taking hold on that tree. So just cutting that at the base and um, so that ivy doesn't um, start to take over and, and stop the lichens from growing there. And um, the central image, this is a, a veteran ash. This is in the Bobby Valley on Dartmoor again. Uh, and a similar sort of story, a bit more ivy growing on there, but that ivy hasn't yet become an important habitat for bats, for example. Um, and within these woodlands, there is a lot of ivy and a lot of ivy that is extensive. So those trees, such as the tree on the right, would never ever be touched. You know, that, that ivy is left because it's a really important habitat uh, for lots of other wildlife, such as bats. Um, but where the ivy hasn't become an important habitat for those species yet, but could impact on the lichens, uh, that's where we're looking to manage that. Obviously in the right-hand image, there wouldn't be any lichen interest on that tree anymore anyway, um, because it's got that, that ivy growing on it. So it's, again, it's all about having a, a mix within the woodland. Okay, um, so as well as the invasive native and near native species, they've got a lack of grazing uh, or browsing, or in some cases too much. Uh, so again, this is an issue that can sometimes be perceived as controversial. Um, in a lot of our temperate rainforests, um, the issue is more of a lack of grazing. Uh, many of these woodlands historically would have been quite open. Um, a lot of it would have been wood pasture um, with the trees quite widely spaced and quite a lot of light coming in, which is why they are so important for these lichens. That's why these lichens exist there in the first place. Um, and over time, that grazing has been removed from the woodland, leading to much more dense uh, understories, more dense canopies, uh, and threatening those lichens and some of the bryophytes uh, indeed there as well. So in terms of grazing, um, you can see here, this is a site in Wales actually, uh, where a fence has been put up. And you can see on the right hand side of this image, the area which is grazed. Um, and on the left hand side, the area where grazing has been fenced out. Um, so on the left hand side, you're starting to get a lot of bramble growth. Um, there's quite a bit of ivy growing along the ground as well, and a lot of dense regeneration taking place there. Because on the right hand side, you can see the bryophytes are really carpeting the rocks uh, and the ground there. And there is still some regeneration on that side, um, but there's a lot more light coming in for the lichens on the trunks and for the bryophytes on the ground as well. This is taken from our management handbook. So again, it is about having a balance. Um, and this is just giving a, an idea as to how you can assess whether the grazing uh, in an area is too high or, or too low, or whether it's about right. So if there's no regeneration taking place at all in terms of the trees, um, then potentially that grazing level might be too high. Often we um, 
expect a bit too much in terms of tree regeneration. So um, a lack of oak regeneration is talked about quite a lot. Um, but oaks are very long lived tree, so we might not expect to see um, dozens and dozens of oak seedlings coming through all at once. So as long as there is some degree of regeneration, um, then, then that's, that's fine. Um, if the grazing is too high, we would actually expect to see very limited vascular plant cover, except for perhaps bracken, um, and no patches of bramble surviving at all. Um, if the grazing is too low, we have this mass regeneration, we have bramble sort of throughout the woodland, um, and vascular plant growth dominating, and, and we don't have that kind of bryophyte carpeting uh, the floor. Um, so what we're looking for is a bit of a compromise, so a little bit of tree regeneration. Um, we might have some patchy areas of bramble. Um, the ground we would want to see being dominated by bryophytes, but still with some vascular plant growth. So it gives you a little bit of an idea about how to assess that. Um, and the other thing to say with grazing as well, and um, we often talk about grazing from the lichen perspective, but from the bryophyte perspective, um, one of the important things that grazing animals do when they move around the woodland is actually knocking off uh, mats of bryophytes, uh, the sort of late successional species that you get developing on boulders and things like that. And um, so with a loss of grazing, another effect of that is that you start to lose some of the early colonizing bryophytes and the late colonizers, the late successional species take over because it's not just the actual grazing action, but it's the, it's the loss of the movement of those animals and the effects that that has. Okay. You can see a lot of the issues that we talk about are to do with, uh, to do with shading in the woodland. And um, so that's a real theme throughout a lot of the work that we're doing is about opening up, letting light in um, in certain situations, but whilst also considering um, the need to maintain canopy cover to, um, to have a reasonable uh, level of humidity, particularly for the bryophytes. So again, it's all about balance. And then alongside this, we have those um, bigger issues, uh, the sort of landscape scale problems um, that we need to consider as well. Uh, so habitat fragmentation, the fact that woodlands are more isolated, air pollution, uh, climate change, which we've talked about quite a bit, and then ash dieback in particular, um, being a big, a big issue that we need to think about at the moment with our work. Okay, and um, so before I um, sort of hand over to my colleague Kate, I want to just give you a few examples um, of, of woodlands. These are, these are all woodlands we've worked in actually. Um, we do this session um, as part, we're running some land manager training at the moment for our project in the southwest and we run some workshop sessions and we, we show images and we get people to think about what um, these images show, you know, what are the features that look good for lichens and bryophytes in these images. Um, does this look like a, an image that has any management issues within it? Um, and, and what would you, if, as a woodland manager, what would you do if this was a bit of woodland that you were managing and how would you prioritise um, that management work? So this first image here is one we show, which, which shows a really good uh, quality area uh, of temperate rainforest. There are lots of, um, lots of really good uh, habitat features. We've got sort of rock faces and boulders. Um, there's, there's plenty of light. Uh, reaching the trunks of the trees. We've got lots of lichen growing on those trunks. We can see there's dead wood. Uh, as we look further back into the image, we can see that there's a, a, a bit of diversity in terms of the age structure of the trees there. We can see that the forest floor is carpeted with mats of bryophytes as well. And we've obviously got the, we've got a waterfall cascading down, so we know it's going to be very, very humid. Um, so if we were assessing this area, this is part of our woodland, um, this area would be somewhere we would think would be high potential uh, for lichens and for bryophytes. And there don't seem to be any major management issues here. Um, from the image, you might wonder about tree regeneration, um, but this area did have um, some regeneration in it. It's just not that easy to see uh, in the image here. Let me show you another picture. 
Um, so this is a site that we've been working on in the Bar Valley on Exmoor. Um, so this has um, some really good features for lichens and bryophytes. Uh, we've got some veteran trees. Uh, there's quite a bit of deadwood here. Um, just down from this slope, there's a floodplain, which is fantastic for Liberian community lichens. Um, there's loads of Liberia pulmonaria tree lungwort, uh, lots of the stinky spicter lichens. Um, and then on these slopes, which are a bit drier, uh, we see some of the ancient dry bark species as well. But there are clearly some management issues here. Um, so we've got um, quite a bit of beet tree generation. You can sort of see the orange patches on here, which are the um, dead leaves that often remain on, on beet even into the winter. Uh, so there's lots of beet tree generation going on. There's a, a bit of holly as well. Um, and actually it gets quite dense in places up on the slopes. Uh, and there's a little bit of an issue with ivy growing up some of those old trees too. Um, so this is a site where we've been working with um, Exmoor National Park um, and the, the landowner to um, halo thin again, to remove quite a bit of that beach regeneration. Um, and it's a really interesting one here because although there's a big debate around whether beach is native to the southwest of England, um, and many people feel it's not a native species in the area, um, but it's culturally very significant. And the, the beach hedges um, on Exmoor are, are often featured on, on postcards, it's sort of iconic imagery for the area. Um, so it wouldn't be possible to remove the seed trees um, because there's some, and then you wouldn't want to, there's some beautiful old um, ancient beach pollards and beach hedges. Um, nearby. Um, but what that means is you've got this continual supply of uh, beach seedlings. So there needs to be management to, to remove those, those seedlings as they start to create a problem. And um, so we've been halo thinning around those important trees uh, and then very selectively managing the ivy um, where it's affecting the important lichen communities there. And this image here, um, so what we always say to people is try to imagine this is one woodland, where would you prioritise uh, your management? And that previous image is an example of somewhere with high uh, potential for interesting temperate rainforest lichens, but some very, very imminent threats, um, which if left uh, unchecked, would cause those lichens to disappear. This is an area where we can identify quite a few management issues for lichens and bryophytes. Again, there's a lot of dense beach regeneration. We can see that um, there's quite a lot of bramble on the ground. There's not a lot of bryophyte cover. Um, but actually, this is an area that is lower potential in terms of the lichens and bryophytes, um, as well as having those management issues. So this is an area where um, you know, the, the management would be much lower priority because species interest isn't so high. And then this image here, um, this is quite typical of a lot of areas and you've got this real um, dense holly growth along the banks of the river here. Um, so that's affecting the light levels on the trunks of the trees. Uh, and it's also growing over a lot of the boulders which are important habitats for the bryophytes. So again, this is a high potential interest along that river corridor, very, very humid. Um, it's a really nice looking bit of woodland with some old trees there, but this dense holly on the riverbanks which is affecting um, the potential for, um, for those species. So that would um, need, need managing. Okay, so um, the key then to uh, successful management in temperate rainforest is first of all to understand what is the interest from a lichen and bryophyte perspective. Um, what uh, lichen communities are there? What are the key features for lichens and bryophytes in that woodland? And where are they? Um, so without knowing that, it's very, very difficult to, to do successful management um, because we really need to be careful about the conditions that things need because they're so sensitive to change. So knowing what you've got and where it is is the very first step. Um, and then looking at what management issues are there, what's present already in terms of um, potential threats and what's um, emerging, what, what could start to take hold. Um, so this is why we've developed our rapid woodland assessment. 
Um, so this is a tool that um, we devised three years ago at the start of our project here in the southwest. And it's aimed at um, woodland managers, so people can use it on their own sites to get a better understanding of what they've got, where it is, and what the issues are. Um, and then with support can start to then plan uh, what management they can do to improve conditions for lichens and briar finds in their sites. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Kate and she's going to talk to you more about this tool and about how you can do it um, and what it can tell us. Hello everyone, um, let's just check, I'm back, I'm in control. There we go. So I'm going to go through the rapid woodland assessment with you. Um, you don't need a copy of it in front of you because I have uh, got examples of it throughout the next few slides. Hopefully you'll be able to follow. But we are going to put in our chat where you can download it free off our website. Um, so if you want to, you can have a look at it at the same time. But as I said, I have got pictures of it to demonstrate the surveys we go through. So as Alison said, this uh, rapid woodland assessment was created at the beginning of the project. Um, and at the beginning of the project, we did have patchy knowledge about the location and condition of temperate rainforests in our project area in the Southwest. And we wanted to know more about where woodlands with potential are so we can focus our conservation. Um, we wanted to help use it to help us engage with woodland owners here uh, around the southwest and help them improve their woodland health um, and it's a fantastic tool as Alison said for woodland managers to identify lichen and bryophyte interests and management issues and really to help them prioritize areas for management. It also was developed with the aim of volunteers using it as well so it's a really user-friendly tool so hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate that to you. So at the beginning of our project, um, we wanted to know first where the temperate rainforest was here in this area. So we worked with our local record centre, the CBRC, the Devon Record Centre, to create these fantastic maps to help us. And this was going to enable us to target where we did some of our surveys. So the areas on this map are called important plant areas. Uh, and these are the bits in purple. And these are designated important plant areas because they are temperate rainforests. So we have some uh, up in the Quantox in Somerset, uh, on Exmoor, uh, on the north coast of North Devon, wrapping around into Cornwall, and some uh, fantastic parts on Dartmoor as well. So this is where we knew there was temperate rainforest. And then we assumed that we'd also find in the areas close by potentially some more temperate rainforests as well. We also have this map as well, which shows lichen indicator species. And these are species that indicate that it's temperate rainforest because they only grow where the conditions are correct. And also the bryophytes, so these are the mosses and liverworts as well. And they are clustered uh, around where the important plant areas are, which is what we expected to see. But there are also some in other areas. Um, so again, it's helped us kind of think where could be some temperate rainforest and where we could spend some of our resources having a look. So I'm going to show you a bit about the survey. Um, there are five sections to the survey, and I'm going to go through each section with you to give some guidance on how to do each bit. The first section is on woodland composition and structure. The second is on habitat features. The third is lichens and bryophytes. The fourth is the threat assessment. And the fifth is the management assessment. And what you'll notice is that a lot of this um, will summarize what Alison has been discussing this morning. So lots of the things that she talked about are in the survey. So it's really kind of useful to take out with you because it makes sure you don't forget any of the bits that you're looking for. So with the woodland composition and structure, we want you to look at the canopy. So 
these are the trees that have grown right up to the top and are in what we call the canopy. We want you to look at the tree species in the sub canopy. We want you to look at the tree age, the tree density and the ground cover. So this is what the first page of the survey looks like. And at the top, we've got space for you to put the site name, the date, the grid reference, the area that you cover, which is really important, um, the slope, main aspect, and how long it took you. And then we want you to fill out these sections about the canopy. So the first bit with the canopy on there are uh, tree species that we're interested in. So we have alder, ash, beech, birch, oak, sycamore and willow, but there's also space if you want to add in any other tree species in the canopy. And the same for the sub canopy, a slightly different species because um, the sub canopy will have tree species that potentially won't grow up into the canopy. So for example, hazel and hawthorn, they're not going to grow hopefully all, uh, all the way up into the top of the canopy. Um, but again, there's space for you to write any other tree species. And we would like you to record the abundance of these trees in the wood. Um, and we use a scale called the DAFOR scale. So uh, D stands for dominant, A for abundant, F for frequent, O for occasional, and R for rare. So in the wood that you're serving, if it is dominated by oak, so over 70% of the wood or 75% of the wood is oak, you would write a D uh, for the abundance scale. Um, and if you have willow, but you're only seeing one or two in the section of wood you're serving, you would put rare um, or R in that box. And the same for the sub -canopy. The next section is on tree age, tree density and ground cover. And we want you to read the statements and then choose the score. Um, so for tree age, we want you to look at, is it a young, even aged wood? Uh, then it would get a low score, it gets a zero, all the way up to it's a wood with many old big trees and fissured bark, and then it would get a high score of three. The same for tree density, are the trees closely packed together and there are a few gaps between the tree canopy? Or uh, is it a mature woodland with veteran trees, large gaps between the tree canopy? And again, that would get a high score of a three. And the same with ground cover. So is it the ground cover abundant? Um, so the whole floor is covered in brambles and ivy? Or is it rare and it's sparsely cut, as sparse and isolated patches as you go through? Um, and then you would add that up and you will get a total score for that section. And if your scores above six, it indicates high potential for the woodland composition and structure. And something you might notice about these three sections, the age, density and ground cover, is that it does link as well to shading and light. So as Alison was saying, uh, shading is a real issue in the woodlands. And so this will help you assess what the shading is like in that section. We do have some things to help you as well. So um, I find every year when I'm out doing surveys, I do need to keep refreshing my tree species because I've forgotten it from the year before. Um, and the Woodland Trust have these free guides that are actually really useful and they cover the species that are in our survey. So they have a leaf one that you can find on their website and they also have a winter twig one. Um, which is really good if you're going out now and up to kind of March or April. We also have created a, uh, serve, uh, sorry, a video for you, which is on our YouTube page. Um, there are six videos linked to the survey, and this one is about identifying trees in winter. And again, it's only the species that are linked to the survey, but it just might have, find it useful to refresh your ID. And then if you do really get into winter twigs, which I did last year, there is this fantastic book that recently came out as well, uh, The Field Key to Winter Twig. And there's over 400 species in there. So above and beyond what you need for the rapid woodland assessment, but just in case you start to get really interested in that. So I have a few pictures just to show you, to give you kind of an indication on how you might score a section. 
Um, so in this photo, we have a, let me just move my box. We have um, a woodland and you can see the boulders here are covered in moss. Um, and as you're looking into the back of this photo, you can see there's some quite old veteran trees. So we would say this is an old uh, mixed woodland with fissured bark and veteran tree with large canopies, uh, large canopy gaps. So this would score very high and it indicates a high potential for temperate rainforest. The next one is uh, the same photo I have some use of uh, beach woodland. This is on the Quantock. And you can see that the trees are quite closely packed together. There aren't a lot of gaps coming through the canopy um, and the floor is covered in brambles. Walking through, you do get kind of scratched a bit as you wander through. So this potentially would score quite lowly on this section of the survey. Um, there's also um, lots of saplings coming through as well. And finally, uh, this is taken in Exmoor and we've got a lovely large glade here. So lots of lights coming through, but there are uh, veteran trees as well. Um, you can see there's lots of bracken and there is space in the uh, survey to write comments. And this is something that you would most likely want to write down. So it might be something you think you would like to manage as well, because you see there's lots of dense bracken growing here as well. Um, but again, this could be a, a high potential area as well for management. The next section in the survey is about habitat features. And I'm going to show you a very short video that demonstrates them. Um, and again, Alison mentions lots of these features uh, in her presentation. But I do find this is quite useful um, because when you walk into the wood, you sometimes get the idea of what condition it's in and what's there. Um, but you maybe can't remember all the different features. So if somebody says, oh, why is it that? This is quite useful because you can refer back and say, oh, we found lots of dead wood. There were wet features, rock features, and you've recorded all of these. Um, so what we want you to do is if you see any of these features, uh, you would then score that and write it down. But you only need to see these features once. So in the area that you're serving, if you see a pollard, you would mark that down and score a two. If you saw horizontal branches, you would also write a two. Um, and then you would add up the full uh, score for that section. And again, if it's over 12 for this section, it indicates very high potential. So this is a short video, which again is on our YouTube page, you can see. And here we've got all of the different features mentioned. So we have a glade, which is a clearing the wood over 20 meters across. We have veteran trees, and uh, these are wide trees with trunks over two and a half meters girth. You can get veteran trees with a smaller girth, but we found this really useful description for our volunteers. Uh, we want you to look out for old trees with deadwood in the canopy and dead limbs. You can record if you found veteran trees with uh, holes um, present in it as well. This is one of the coppards that Alison mentioned earlier. It's a, not a pollard, not a coppice, it's a coppard. Uh, but you can also include that on the survey. Horizontal branches, and um, lots of you will see lots of things grow on the horizontal branches. So they are really important. Here we've got lots of uh, this gorgeous fern growing along this horizontal branch. Um, there's space to record the different deadwood and as Alison pointed out, deadwood can be really important for interesting species as well. And here in this picture, this deadwood's covered, absolutely covered in mosses. We also have on here rotting tree stumps and standing deadwood.
We want you to, uh, you can record the rock features, so any natural rock faces, and this does include old quarries, um, but not things like walls and bridges. The wet features are their boggy areas, rivers, streams, waterfalls, wet uh, faces to the rocks. So that's um, the different features for that section. And as I said, you can re-watch this video on our YouTube page. The next section is about lichens and bryophytes. And um, I think this bit can sometimes uh, put people off because they're worried they need to identify everything, but we're not asking for that. We want you to look at the abundance that you can see in the woodland. So for the bryophyte section, which is um, predominantly going to be mosses that you're spotting, we want you to just say what the abundance is and you just tick one option here on the survey. So it starts with very little, no bryophyte cover visible at all, right way up to the whole woodland floor is carpeted with bryophytes. And then um, there's a photo in our guide of this as well and you get these fantastic woodlands that just literally covered in mosses all over the woodland floor. So if you see that, you'd put a three, um, whereas if there's nothing at all, you'd put a zero and then the scores in between. With the lichen section, you can tick as many options as apply for this section, so it's slightly different. Um, so we want to know if you see large old trees with lichens on the trunk, then you'd, tick, uh, then you'd put the score three. Trunks with luxuriant lichen growth and fairly frequent, again, you'd put a three. Um, and then there's these other options here as well. So you would put the score in and total up your score. And if it's above six, this indicates it's a high value site. Um, but anything below that would be a moderate or a lower potential site. Now, while you're walking through the wood, we also would like you to keep an eye out for these four species as well. So we've chosen four indicator species, and these have been chosen because they indicate uh, that it's potentially very good woodland, um, but they're also quite easy to identify as well. So we've chosen big species that you'll be able to uh, see and hopefully not confuse with anything else. Um, so I've got some better pictures to so show you. So the first one is called Asnea articulata or string of sausages. And uh, you can see why in this picture. It's one of the um, people call sometimes the beard lichens and you see it hanging off tree branches. Um, it does like light and it's uh, generally kind of midway to higher up on the tree. Um, this one's actually a photo from Arlington and it's even before we've entered into the site, it's on the trees growing there. Um, so it's just outside the car park. The name string of sausages is, if you can see, we've got these inflated like bladders with constrictions along them. Um, and it looks like a string of sausages. And, and there isn't a lichen that has uh, these bladders. You can't confuse it with anything else. Um, but it's very key that you look out for these kind of string of sausages and then you'll know that's what you have. Um, it's also a indicator of clean air. So it's a, a really important lichen if you see it. The next one is closely related. It's part of the Asnea family as well. And it's called Witch's Whiskers or Asnea Florida. And uh, the feature that you have here is these big circular discs that have what look like hairs coming off it which is why it's called a kind of witch's whiskers, like a, a wart with the hairs growing off it. Um, children absolutely love this when they find it as well. It does grow uh, much higher up in the canopy um, because it does love light, but I generally find it when it's been really windy or it's been stormy and it's been knocked off the tree and you'll find it walking while you're walking through the wood on the footpath um, as well. But again, it's also a clean air indicator as well. So Alison mentioned uh, this one earlier. This is the tree lungwort, Liberia pulmonaria. And um, it is kind of a fantastic lichen. It's really big. And uh, in this picture, it's bright green. Um, so when it's wet, it has this lovely, vibrant green color. 
Um, but when it dries out, it does lose that bright green. But you can, um, if you have a spray bottle or some water with you, you can re-wet it and it can go green again. The underneath is a paler colour, so it's kind of a creamy colour um, as well. But it, yes, it's absolutely stunning. It's this large leafy lichen and it uh, kind of resembles a, a lungs with their kind of indentations going through it as well. You'll find this growing uh, really close to water. So you can see on this tree, the tree is right next to the river and it's growing on the side of the tree that's against the river. Um, it does like light, but not too much light. And it doesn't grow very low to the ground because uh, slugs like to eat it. So you won't find it kind of at foot height on the trees um, because the slugs will probably got to it first and munched it off and um, but we kind of find it around chest height um, and maybe a bit higher as well and the last one is a sphicter so these are the sphicter species and um, they grow in very similar places to the liberia so they like wet and moist places um, with light but not too much light because if they don't want the full sun um, they do look similar to the dog lichens but the underneath of this lichen doesn't have any anything hanging off it. So there's no what look like hairs on the underside. It's a light colour on the underside again, it's kind of a creamy colour. And the top tends to be these darker browns and blacks that you get as well. And some of them um, have a strong smell. Um, so if you see any of these four lichens, um, please record them on the survey. But also if you're able to take a picture and the location and send it in to us. We would like to know about them as well. We do have um, some videos on our YouTube page um, of Alison showing you how to identify some of these species. So there is one on identifying the string of sausages and there is one on how to identify tree lungwort. So you can see those on our playlist as well, um, but I'm not gonna show them to you today. The next section is on the threats. Um, so Alison went through some of these earlier as well. So in the survey, you can record, there we go, um, is there dense holly, uh, rhododendron and laurel, Himalayan balsam, conifers, and any dense regeneration of any species. So again, with the holly, if it's densely growing, it can shade out some of these light loving lichens and some of the mosses. The same with rhododendron and laurel and rhododendron is uh, a particular issue in Scotland. Um, Himalayan balsam, this can be hard to identify if it's not flowering. Um, so as, you go, as we're going into winter, it kind of dies off, particularly it grows along the, the riverbank. Um, and then it dies off around now, leaving the riverbank quite bare, um, which is an issue in itself because of erosion. But this will come back in the spring. And then as it grows back up, it has those beautiful pink flowers um, that help you identify it. We've got conifers on here. Again, in the temperate rainforest, they can cause huge shading issues. And then any dense regeneration of sycamore or beech, or any other species you might see that you think um, are causing an issue, you can write those on there as well. And we have a scoring system again, and a little bit to help you interpret your score as well. And then the last section on here, the fifth section is a management assessment. So we want you to say is, uh, look to see if the site is fenced, um, and is the fencing in good repair? Is there any evidence of grazing? And can you tell what animal it is? So um, it might be quite obvious if you see um, some grazing uh, cows in there working through, or it could be that uh, you think it could be a some deer because you've seen some hoof prints. Um, so if you do have those, uh, you can write that down in the comment box as well. We also want you to notice if there's any coppicing, any thinning, any scrub clearance, any management of the invasive species. And if you do see any ivy stems cut at the base of trees as well. So you can record all of that 
in this section. And there is a comments box after this as well, so you can write any of your observations. So um, we have run quite a bit of uh, training on how to do this survey, and these are the most common questions that we get asked. The first one uh, is how big should the area be that I survey? Um, and generally our answer is, um, the first thing is you really need to record where you survey because if you want to go back or if you decide to submit the results to us, you want to be able to know exactly the area that you've surveyed. So it might be that you've only done a small section of a wood or you might have done the whole of a wood, but you just need to keep an idea of which part that you've done. If you're in a wood and uh, for example, it's a oak woodland um, and as you move through, it changes dramatically into a conifer woodland we would say that you should start a new survey then because it's a new type of woodland. So if you're moving through and it, it kind of changes into a different type of woodland, we would recommend starting a, a completely new survey for that. Um, how long it takes is between, it seems to be averaging between one and two hours um, from the people who've completed the survey. Um, you can do the survey all year round, hence why we've got some winter twig uh, resources to help you. There isn't a particular time of year. Um, it's just in the winter, you may have to imagine the gaps that the canopy would have if the leaves aren't present. Um, you don't need to do the survey every year. If you are managing a wood, you might think that you want to do it at the beginning and then after some management and then potentially go back again um, in a year or five years time to see if there are any uh, differences. Um, but you can just do it once. And when you're doing your scoring, um, people can be a bit concerned if they've put a two and it should have been a three or a, a one, and it should have been a two. Um, those uh, subtle differences won't make a huge difference to the overall interpretation of uh, the survey or to those sections of the survey. So um, if you're worrying between is it a two or a three, I would go for the whichever one you thought first, but you can always write comments as well to help you. And um, as I said, we do have on our YouTube page, so this is the name of the project's YouTube page, Building Resilience in Southwest Woodlands. And if you go to the playlist section, so at the top there's a menu that says home, videos, playlists. Uh, there's all our different playlists there, and there's one called Rapid Woodland Assessments that you can see I've tried to highlight with the yellow. Um, and there's six videos in there that are to help you with the survey. Um, we have had volunteers submitting their results to us for the Southwest, and that's been really useful for us. And we will be doing analysis of that in the new year. Um, so if you have decided to go out in the Southwest and you'd like to submit your results, um, to do this, there is a link on the back of the survey or you can go to our uh, web page and it says looking to enter your assessment results, click here and it will take you through to submit your results. Um, and the online form looks very similar to your actual survey. So it won't be um, very strange to you when you go to put your results in. However, we also have created a video to help you as well. Um, so on that YouTube page with the playlist, there is one about how to submit your results. This is a snapshot of where all of our results so far have been submitted. We've had a fantastic response from volunteers here in the Southwest, and we've had over 230 results submitted and dotted all over. Dartmoor has had uh, quite a lot uh, of surveys submitted there, and then Exmoor as well. And, uh, Surveys open for a couple more months for us um, before we close it because we want to look at the results. So we're hoping to get a few more in Cornwall um, and in some of these other areas that haven't had as many surveys as well. Um, but you can see we've had a really fantastic uptake of the survey. And we have started to look at those results to get an idea of uh, what people are saying as well in the surveys. Um, 15% of the sites surveyed have a high score for the abundance of lichens and bryophytes. Um, 
And those ones that have a high score for lichens and bryophytes have also scored really highly in the rapid woodland assessment for the woodland composition and structure as well. And we've also found that lots of these are close to the IPAs. So they're not in them, but they're very close um, in location to the important plant areas, the map I showed at the beginning. We have found as well, 80% of the sites have dense holly growth. And you can see that in this picture, there's lots and lots of holly, and it kind of makes some of the woodlands impenetrable. You can't get into them because there's so much holly. We've also found a third of the sites so far have rhododendron and laurel, and a quarter of the sites have dense regeneration of beech and sycamore as well. So these are all things that Alison mentioned um, reduce the amount of light and cause a lot of shading in the woodlands. So we have some uh, further resources that you can check out as well. Uh, we have a handbook that Alison mentioned, which is on our website. Um, and that's uh, for woodland managers on managing Atlantic woodland. And in the new year, we're putting together some online interactive courses on lichens and bryophytes and ferns, as well as managing the rainforest and management case studies. There is on our YouTube page a fantastic video already on how to identify ferns that our colleague Rachel did. So if you're interested in that, um, I've watched it a couple of times just to really help. And, and it's really good at um, teaching you how to identify the ferns. Um, but there's lots of different videos that we have there. And then this uh, online interactive courses will be coming in the new year as well. So I think we are going to go to questions. I think there's quite a lot in the Q&A and the chat. Um, but this last slide is just to remind you that we do have another week of uh, talks, as Alison said, um, coming up in the Fall into Nature. I think there's one this afternoon as well. Um, and do check out the Plant Life uh, YouTube page if you would like to see any of those. Um, but yeah, let's, Alison, let's check out the have you had a chance to look at some of the questions coming through? Yeah, yeah, we've got a few questions um, which we will we'll go through now. Um, just to clarify as well, you'd have seen on some of our resources, if you looked at them, we talk about Atlantic woodland. Um, that is temperate rainforest. We just now are referring it more, more um, specifically as temperate rainforest. Um, so that it links in with that idea that this is a global habitat and not just something that's specific to the UK. So um, if you're wondering why some of the things uh, guides to managing Atlantic woodland um, as opposed to temperate rainforest, it is it's still the same thing and it's still applicable. Um, and the guide um, that um, Kate just showed, the management handbook, is one we did for Southwest England, but the issues are largely applicable to the rest of the UK. And in the new year, we'll be launching our online version, um, which will be interactive, and that will be applicable to the whole of the UK as well. Um, so yes, we've got a number of questions in the Q&A. So I think we'll probably just go through um, one by one and try to answer those um, as best we can. Kate, do you want to read the questions out and then? Yes, yes. Um, so we have someone currently harvesting commercial Sitka spruce uh, planted in the 1960s on ancient woodlands on the Isle of Mull. Um, we have remnant oak forests and plan to replant with native broadleaves to restore what was there originally. Any suggestions for encouraging lichens and bryophytes? Yeah, uh, that sounds really interesting. And um, I mean, obviously, given the location, um, you've got the right sort of climate. Um, so there's good potential. And I think it depends on whether you've got nearby um, woodland with ecological continuity um, will, will, will influence how quickly things will colonise, whether you've got that sort of adjoining where you're going to be doing the replanting um, or whether it's going to be completely isolated. <laughs> Um, but in terms of tips, I mean, I think, you know, obviously thinking about how you're planting and how close together you're planting the new trees is going to be really important. Um, and I don't know whether there's um, any potential for any natural regeneration as well. Um, but thinking about not planting too close together, but also varying the stocking density. So if you've got 
um, riparian areas, you might look to have a bit more canopy cover around those to help maintain humidity for bryophytes. Um, and making sure you have other areas that are more open for the lichens. So trying to create um, as much as possible a kind of natural, more natural structure um, and not overstocking, I think, is, is important. And also thinking about the species that you're using. So you've got a range of, of native um, and native to that area species. Um, so you've got different substrates uh, for lichens and bryophytes. And I'd also look at um, any remnant interest. So sometimes on um, plantations, um, you, you don't tend to get the seed bank. And this is a question that's come up um, a few times recently asking about sort of moss spores, for example, whether they might remain in soil in the same way that seeds do in a seed bank. And once you remove a plantation, you would then get those things emerging. Um, because spores don't have the same sort of protection that seeds have, they don't tend to remain unless they're in ice um, or in peat where they're not going to degrade. So it's unlikely that you would have that. So you're looking for recolonization. Um, but sometimes on, on plantations, you have remnant interest in areas that have remained undisturbed. So for example, if you've got a bit of a rocky ravine um, or you've got, um, some riparian areas and the uh, and areas that haven't been um that the ground hasn't really been disturbed sometimes on banks or on rides you may have um interest still there um i know liberia pulmonaria the tree lungwort lichen has stayed um on plantation sites in in amongst boulders in areas that have been more well lit than the rest of the plantation and certainly on some sites down in southwest England where we've been working uh, with the Woodland Trust where they're doing a lot of paws restoration some of the some of the banks have a lot of bryophyte interest still even though the rest of the woodland has lost it so that's definitely worth looking at when you're doing the removal um, of the, uh, the Sitka spruce thinking about if those areas exist protecting those so they don't get disturbed um, I think that would be important as well um, so, uh, so yeah, lots of things to think about. Um, okay, um, the next question, I think someone's raised their hand, but if you can put your question or comment in the Q&A or the chat for us, that'd be really helpful um, as well. The next question is, are there any late succession bryophytes that are important or are they mainly the early succession ones? Yeah, so I think, so I was talking about, um, the action of grazing animals and how they can help with um, the bryophyte species diversity because they will knock off some of the sort of late successional bryophytes off of boulders and off of ledges and then you'll get some of the early colonizers coming in there um, which is you know a, a natural process um, and it's not the case that the late successional ones aren't important because many of the rare and important species are late successional species it's just about having that diversity and where you don't have the action of herbivores and, and you know going back to a sort of wildwood scenario you would have had large herbivores moving around creating that disturbance um, where you don't have that disturbance you you're just not getting the the removal of, of any of those late successional species so those early colonizers run out of of, of niche they run out of places to, to grow so it's not that the early successional ones are more important than the late successional ones it's just about having a, a, again having a range having a mix of those um, the and next the question is from Tara um, I'm going to apologize if I pronounce this wrong are there particular or rare species or communities in frid habitat is that similar to calm habitat Alison um, no, so I, um, I'm, I'm not that familiar with, with whales and Welsh habitats and land management. So um, we've had a little look to it. I could try and find out what sort of habitat you're talking about. But um, it, it looks like um, it's quite variable as a habitat type, but it's sort of upland fringe. Um, and I think there, there will certainly be areas of that habitat which are very rich. Um, for um, some of the lichen communities that we're talking about. And I think the more sort of, I think some of that looks a bit like open wood pasture. Um, so where you've got that kind of woodland fringe and you've got open wood pasture, it's within the temperate rainforest climatic zone. 
um, then you, you will certainly have um, potential for rare species and communities. And it's the ones that we've been talking about that you get in temperate rainforest. Um, so I'd be thinking about the, the sort of open wood pasture elements of that habitat. Um, we do have um, for whales um, at the moment, the, we have a guide specifically to the smooth bark community lichens. Um, but for the other ones, for the uh, other communities we've talked about, like the Liberian community and the Parmelian community of lichens, um, the Southwest England guides will be quite applicable um, to what you're finding there. And um, so they might be a good starting point to look at. Uh, we don't have specific ones on those communities for Wales at the moment, just because we haven't had um, sort of a big lottery funded project in Wales. Um, a lot of our work in Wales has been focused on on the ground management work. Um, but I think the, the South, we've got the Southwest England and the Scotland guides. Um, so between those, um, you'll be able to, to find quite a few of the indicator species. Um, we have a question about, oh, I'm going, is that a lot of feedback? That's better. We have a question about um, doing the survey and if uh, they've got two distinct areas. So um, the question is, my small ancient woodland has two distinctly different areas. Uh, one area is a floodplain along the river and a larger steeply sloping area. Should these be recorded separately? So should you do um, a survey along the river, a floodplain, and then a separate one for the larger steeply sloping area? I think as a, as a woodland manager, it's a tool um, to help you to identify which areas might be most important for lichens and bryophytes. So to some extent, um, what makes it easier for you to do that and to gather the information that you need is probably the best approach. I would say um, if those two areas are quite distinct in terms of their structure, um, you know, how, how densely packed the trees are, the age structure, if they're, if they're quite distinct, then it might be easier to do those as two separate rapid woodland assessments. Um, if they're quite similar, and it's just the case that, you know, one is under the floodplain and one's in the valley um, on, the, on the slopes, then you might want to just do that as one, one assessment. Uh, the next question, is the rapid uh, woodland assessment um, okay to use for those outside of the southwest? Yeah, so again, we've developed it um, with a sort of dual purpose, really. Um, so one is as a tool for woodland managers to um, understand their sites better um, and to identify key areas for lichens and bryophytes and what the issues are. So you can use it for yourself as a management tool to help you plan management, um, in which case people can use it wherever um, you are. And I know that the um, Saving Scotland's Rainforest Alliance are looking to adapt uh, the rapid woodland assessment for Scotland um, and possibly to launch uh, a project up there that will gather data back in as well. So watch this space for that. Um, in terms of submitting data, the, so the other reason we've done the rapid woodland assessment in the Southwest is to help us at Plant Life and our partner organisations better understand the temperate rainforest across the region, particularly because we're thinking about habitat fragmentation and trying to help some of the big land managers that we work with engage with their neighbours better um, so that we can manage at a sort of more landscape scale. So that's the bit that sort of at the moment is southwest only where we're collecting people's data back in analyzing it and making use of it. But in terms of using it for yourself as a management tool, it is largely applicable to the whole UK. The indicator species bit is the only bit that's sort of Southwest specific. We chose four indicator species that are very relevant here. Um, there is a Lake District version because we had another project doing that in the Lake District and there's those four indicator species. Um, so I think two of the species are different. Um, so that's the only bit that may not be as applicable, but really it's the rest, as a, as a land manager, it's the rest of the survey that's useful to you. So people are more than welcome to use that um, um, elsewhere. This next question, I think we're quite good at um, clarifying a couple of things as well. So uh, the question is, could you briefly tell us a bit about the biodiversity of other taxa in mm. temperate rainforests? especially given the recommended, recommended management of suppressing vascular plants, subcanopy and tree regeneration. 
Mm. So I think it's really important. I'm glad that question was asked. I think it's really important to clarify that we're not making broad scale recommendations to do those things. Um, this is all about using, like the rapid woodland assessment, to understand where your lichen interest is, where your bryophyte interest is, and targeting specific management to those areas. So we're definitely not saying that you should open up the canopy throughout your woodland um, and you should, um, you know, apply this to all of the areas. You should control all the ivy on all your veteran trees, et cetera, et cetera, because that wouldn't make sense in terms of um, woodland management. And we recognize the importance of managing for a whole wide range of taxa. And um, so the important thing is to know where you have rare and interesting life and bryophyte communities and manage um, carefully and according to those things. It's also important to understand what other interests you have on your site. And it depends on where you're working. So a lot of the woodland managers that we work with in the Southwest um, have um, dormice um, on their sites. So they're thinking about um, areas where they want to coppice hazel for, for dormice habitat and they want to bramble on the ground, obviously, for dormice there. Um, they may also have important um, smooth bark lichen communities. Um, so knowing where those are will help to inform which areas of hazel they might coppice, which areas some of the older hazel um, that they have important lichens on, which they wouldn't coppice, which areas they might graze and which areas they might want to exclude grazing from because they have dormice, so they want the bramble there. So it's all about understanding what you have on your site and where. And I think often woodland managers have a better understanding of their mammal interest, their bird interest, because these are things that generally we know people generally know more about, um, but don't have a good understanding of where their bryophyte and lichen interest is. So that's what we're trying to achieve. Um, but temperate rainforests are often important for birds such as pied flycatchers um, and certain bird species will need um, the shrub layer and that's very important. So again, we're not talking about getting rid of a shrub layer, we're talking about having a diverse structure in a woodland that has open and shaded patches, that has denser areas of shrubs and then clearer areas. So again, when we're talking about managing holly, I was saying we're not talking about getting rid of all the holly, we're talking about halo thinning around important trees. So it's really important to make that point because I think it can become controversial if people start thinking about single species management um, and about these very broad brush approaches and that's not what we're about at plant life. Um, we're trying to give people the tools so that they can understand where their lichen and bryophyte interest is um, and tailor management to specific areas. Um, and we're running management workshops at the moment for land managers. And one of the big key topics in those workshops is about cross taxa management and how you can make things work for the range of species that you have at your site. And then the last question I have, um, unless anyone would like, we still have a bit more time if anyone wants to ask anything else. But the last one that's in here at the moment is, do you know of any organisations working to protect temperate rainforests in the Republic of Ireland? Um, yeah, I actually, I actually have to confess ignorance here. I don't, um, I'm not aware, but that is definitely not um, because there aren't any. And um, that's just my own uh, limitations to my knowledge of what's happening in the Republic of Ireland. Um, I, um, we can find out for you um, and plant life is, uh, you know, we, we do work internationally as well. Um, so we would, um, I'm sure, be interested in, in being involved and working with, with partners there. Um, but, but my remit, I don't work on plant life, temperate rainforest work nationally. I, I specifically work in the southwest. So our colleague, um, Dave Lammercraft, who isn't here, is our um, lower plant champion. He works on lichens and bryophytes um, for the whole of the organisation. Um, would have a much better um, answer to your question, I'm sure. So we will go away and try and find out the answer to that one. I'm sorry, that's um, just my own ignorance there. I'm not sure. Um, I have a question about ash dieback. Um, so this person has extensive ash dieback and some of the fell trees are strung a sausage present at high level. Um, what species uh, would you recommend replanting? 
Um, so it's, it is difficult to give out general advice um, with these sorts of things without knowing about your specific woodland. Um, so there's a number of things. So I would say with, with string of sausages as near articulator, it's not a lichen that's specific to ash. It just likes um, often the canopies and the twigs, very, very well lit areas. So hopefully you will have that growing on other trees, um, not just besides the ash. Um, so the first thing um, we're looking at, where we're looking at mitigating the loss of ash in woodlands for lichens and bryophytes, is thinking about what tree, trees are already in the woodland. Um, because replanting would be a sort of last resort, um, where probably where you've got you know, really ash dominated sites. Um, but, but in a lot of places, there will be existing trees that will support the lichen communities that are on ash. So with Liber we're often looking at Liberian community lichens, which will grow on old oak, and they'll grow very well on hazel, they'll grow on willow. They'll also grow on uh, maples, old sycamore can be quite good, although the bark does tend to shed, so it's something to be aware of. Um, so it's about looking at what existing trees are in the wood that will support those lichens and enhancing the conditions around those trees so that they are suitable for those lichens. Um, so that's sort of the first thing to think about. Um, another thing we are thinking about, again, is more of a sort of, um, you know, less like, well, first thing is actually keeping the ash in the landscape if possible. Um, so if it's possible to monolith the ash instead of felling it completely, then the, like, the lichens are on the trunks, then they have a lot longer um, to, to survive. A lot of the lichens um, reproduce asexually and will shed um, isidia or ceridia, the little asexual propagules. So it gives them a chance to do that. And if the conditions are improved on the other trees that those lichens could survive on, that the hope is that they will colonize those other trees. Um, Next thing would be thinking about possibly translocating if there are rare lichens involved um, and the, the, the ash trees are dying and need to be felled, um, then some lichens potentially could be moved onto um, alternative trees. Um, and then finally, if, you, if, if replanting of trees is sort of the last resort, um, then it, again, it depends what you're replanting them for. From a lichen perspective, um, the, um, so oak, old oak, but then that's obviously going to take time. So if you don't already have it, be looking at willow, hazel, um, field maple. Um, it has a similar bark pH. Um, so yeah, those sorts of things. Uh, plant life is produced. I think we have actually published um, guidance on ash dieback. So um, it's worth looking on our website for that. Um, a report about mitigating the impacts of ash dieback on lichens, um, which ha will have some more specific recommendations. The link for that has just been put into our chat um, behind the scenes, so <laughs> please do check that out as well. Um, I think that's our last question. Um, if anybody else would like to ask something, we still do have a little bit of time um, to take any more questions. If, uh, if not, this is being recorded, um, as we said before, so um, it won't be very long until you can uh, find this on the Plant Life YouTube page um, and on our project. Um, we have a project Facebook page as well, so it will be there and our project YouTube page as well. So if there's anything you want to recap on or go back through, um, we'll get that up as soon as possible for you to see. Did you see this one? No. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. And um, we hope you found it really interesting and useful and uh, all the resources that we've put in the chat as well. We hope you can find. Um, if you do have any questions, please do get in contact with us. Um, our details are on the Plant Life website and we'd be happy to um, take any more questions that you have through email as well. Um, but yeah, thank you very much from myself and Alison.
Right, I'm going to um, end the webinar.